I, I, you know, I want to thank you very much. I want to bring, I want to bring up Peter, you know, to do that. After that, then everybody come and speak. So Peter Regina. Thank you. Yeah. It's great to be here again. I don't think I'm gonna. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna use the microphone. <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna talk, and uh, this should. You want me to take the light off? Or? Uh, yeah, that probably. Okay. Just, just a little bit. Not, not a. Not, not a hot light. Just yeah. obviously get a better shot. Thank you. Put the to come. Yep. Okay, so in this journey of peace lights, I'm just going to mention peace lights and starting, starting from right here. Peace lights has uh, come to be because of a comment that Sheikh made to me during a, an event at the New York Peace Coalition. Mm -hmm. And uh, that led me to think, and uh, I wanted to also introduce my partner on this, is Eileen Cohen. And she's an amazing, uh, amazing video artist that we had met, started doing light shows in New York City, met Edna, met the Sheikh, and uh, the conversation was something like, uh, hey, it has such good energy in that corner. How about a video uh, like that as a symbol of good energy? And I just told this story to a couple people, but. Uh, so that, that was uh, well received, we delivered it, and Peace Lights is now the, the official symbol of peace and nonviolence for the peace organizations of 18 countries. The United Nations International Year of Light has endorsed Peace Lights, and literally it plays all over the world. The colors represent the different cultures in the world. The motion represents how those cultures interact to achieve this good harmony and peace. So it has been shown not only at peace events, but also at, uh, at other events where support from the community is something that's looked for, gun violence events, some st stuff like that. So here we are, eight times at the United Nations, and during this time, started meeting some very you know, important and influential people. Um, Sadiq Y, Montgomery Tapper, Dr. Nahar Hussain, you know, a lot of people from around, around the world, including, notably, today, Ms. Claudette Colvin, okay? I remember showing up at the headquarters and Shake, I was a little early that day, Shake goes, uh, he, he, was, he was visibly excited, <laughs> you know, he was visibly excited. And I said, uh, what's up? He goes, oh, we found her, we found her. <laughs> I was like, who'd you find, Shake? I'm like, oh, we found Claudette Colvin. You know, I didn't know the name. <laughs> and that's not uncommon from what I've found since then, that not enough people know who this woman is, nor do enough people know what this woman did and the context of what was going on and her strategic importance to what's going on. So right away I was invited, well Peace Lights was invited, to the celebration that they were going to have for this woman on the first day of December, the first day of the month of peace at the Bronx Public Library. And I was invited to not only bring Peace Lights but to say a few words so I figured I'd better learn what this woman is all about. Of course I waited to the last minute, so over Thanksgiving break. I went to the library, and just as I was standing there saying, okay, what's, what's my strategy going to be to find a book on Claudette Colvin? It's not like, you know, you got the old card cabinets anymore. I looked over, and from about here to the wall was a book on Claudette Colvin. It was, it was, mm -hmm. I, I had, the, the, the hair stood, stood up. It's like, wow, you know, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Turns out that the, this was next to another book on Rosa Parks. Now, Rosa Parks did her thing on December 1st of 1955. So that's why the Rosa Parks was there, that's why the Claudette Colvin. But I didn't know that until about 10 minutes. I was driving home saying that was really so weird, and I was obsessing over it. I was like, that's why. So uh, to, to talk about what you said, Claudette Colvin actually signed this book. I bought it from the, mm -hmm. from the library yeah. because uh, I wasn't going to give it back. <laughs> so this is her story, and then the story of how the people I was meeting through my association with the Peace Coalition kind of led into this whole African Union vision based on the story of Claudette Colvin. So, quick, re quick Black History Month uh, just passed. 1955, Montgomery, Alabama. The law was the first five rows of any bus was for whites only. But what was happening in Montgomery was that if the white section filled up, they would ask the people in row six to stand and move it to the back, even if they had to stand and even if only one white person were to sit. Claudette Colvin was the first person to not give up her seat. Now that day was 63 years ago today. She was with 13 of her friends coming home from school and the bus driver said, 
get out. Her three, three of her friends in, the, in a row of four got out. She stayed. She was yelled at. She was berated. She was told to move. It took the bus two stops before they could find a place where the cop would come on board and drag her off the bus all the while saying, it's my constitutional right. I paid my fare. It's my constitutional right. So what struck me in that book was a phrase right at the beginning of the book where Claudette Colvin is credited with, quote, accelerating the change in the plight of colored people. I said, wow, I'm an engineer, right? Accelerating change is a derivative. You know, change is, you know, right? So accelerating a change is something like not like just saying A equals B, right? So I said, what does that really mean? Typed in Google, plight of colored people, 1955. First thing that came up was a whole bunch of stuff on lynchings. So just a couple pictures. Lynchings. There were 4,000 lynchings in the United States from the end of the Civil War to 1955. And each circle represents a county, and the size of the circle represents how many lynchings there were. Right here is where Montgomery, Alabama is, some big circles right in there. So there was not a lot of, uh, a lot of peace going on at that time. It was an entirely different time all over the place. Now, when I typed in Plight of Colored People, 1955, and saw lynchings, I had an epiphany. You could say legitimately, historically accurately, that the plight of colored people in 1955 could be measured in deaths per day. Mm -hmm. right? So if you could say that, eventually it dropped off. Right? So eventually deaths per day, whenever that happened, dropped off. If you accelerate the change in that plight of colored people, it means that you are pushing that curve to the left in time. And what that means is that people who died, which were underneath the curve, some of them are no longer dead. So those are people who didn't die because the acceleration of the change happened and Claudette Colvin is credited with that. Historically, why is she credited with that? Well, it's because the actions that led to Rosa Parks doing her thing on December 1st of that year, and subsequently Martin Luther King and, and the, the bus boycott and a lot of other things, all happened because that there was a wake-up call, and that wake-up call was Rosa Parks getting arrested. She said, and the way she got arrested was really part of that wake-up call. She said, it's my constitutional right, and indeed it was. Right? So now, wow, what are they going to do about it? They had known for a while that it wasn't right, but now, the issue was forced, and Claudette Colvin was the reason it was forced. That's the reason all of that subsequent stuff happened on the timeline that it happened. When Rosa Parks got arrested, she was a seamstress, right? But there happened to be a photographer there, and she happened to be dressed to the nines, right? Not going or, com or coming from her seamstress job as was the story, right? So all of that was historically, opinion, in my opinion, staged. Fine. Kudos, right? It was, it was what needed to happen, and it happened. But it happened because of Claudette Colvin doing her thing. Right? It was not Rosa Parks' lawsuit going up to the Supreme Court that changed the law. It was Claudette Colvin's <coughs> lawsuit in the form of Browder versus Gale. There were four people. Claudette Colvin was the first person. There was a 17-year-old, a 35-year-old Browder, and two senior citizens. One of the senior citizens was, was threatened, and she pulled herself out. So she was discouraged off, off, of the, off of the thing. And Browder, being the 35-year-old, was in the middle. They used her name. They also didn't want to use Claudette Colvin's name because she was a 16-year-old. She was already pregnant at the time, or she had just become pregnant. And she was a short, dark-skinned, not good symbol of what they were trying to do strategically. And it was a good decision. But we're left with a woman who literally saved lives, and we're talking about her in the county in the United States with the most African immigrants, African immigrants being part of the diaspora, descendants of slaves being part of the defined diaspora, and the diaspora in the African Union, I come to learn because of meeting all these people, you know, Sheikh's doing things like, hey, call up the ambassador from the UN and mention my name, and sure enough, next Tuesday I'm meeting with the guy, right? So because of these series of meetings that I've been fortunate enough to have, 
this story has come together in my mind. And the story leads me from this graph that this woman literally saved lives in the diaspora. And the African Union should kind of take note of this, not only because it was relevant for diaspora people, but because there are lessons in how it happened that relate to the African Union today. And that's kind of where I want to go with this story to talk a little bit about what we learned from and what we can learn from Claudette Colvin and how we can today apply it and how it's still relevant. So I'm going to go through some stories. I, I, I started to think, all right, how did this 15-year-old girl get the education and gumption to do what she did, to reference a peace document at the right time and appropriately, and to kind of get the guts to do what she did? Now, that was a very ballsy move in 1955. Right? So, it turns out that Mrs. Geraldine Nesbitt, her English teacher, was taking time out of teaching English to teach the kids about the Constitution, the Articles of Confederation, the Magna Carta, Brown versus Board of Education, the desegregation case in the United States, Topeka, Kansas. Happened in 1953, went up to the Supreme Court in 1954. All this is fresh. So, Claudette Colvin was being exposed you know, to all of these good things, the, the role models, the first kids that went into the desegregated schools, all because of Mrs. Geraldine Nesbitt. Come on. Okay, so if we can say that Claudette Colvin literally saved lives, which she did, nobody, nobody argues that. A lot of people, my findings as I do a lot of these talks are, are pretty similar. People don't know who Claudette Colvin is. People think that Rosa Parks sat in the front of the bus. People think that Rosa Parks' lawsuit was the one that changed the law because she was the symbol. And she was recognized with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, like you mentioned before. And absolutely, Claudette Colvin is deserving of the Met Presidential Medal of Freedom. If Claudette Colvin saved lives, then the person who taught her and gave her the knowledge to do what she did can arguably be credited with literally saving lives. And in a little bit of an extension of that, it's really what she taught their class that was important to changing lives. Not that what she taught entirely defines what peace education is, because I'm going to talk about what is peace education, because that's no one knows, right? But you could say that the stuff that she taught them would fall under the umbrella of peace education. Now, interestingly, as I was meeting with some of these people, many of whom Shake opened the door for, I was uh, introduced to Agenda 2063. So, uh, in my travels, not many people know Agenda 2063. All the AU people, a lot of people here uh, know Agenda 2063. So, in the old days, China used to do 100-year plans that they would manage across dynasties, and they would stay on these tracks. So the African Union, 54 nations, 2.2 billion people, the most conflict-ridden part of the world, took a page out of that Chinese book and said, we're going to do a 50-year plan. We're going to have seven aspirations, and we're going to try and live to those. And in 2063, they came out with their agenda, 2063, and it had seven aspirations, the fourth of which is a peaceful and secure Africa. Now let's take a, take a look. So we're going to apply Claudette Colvin's example to the future. The African Union, I told you about them, there's Agenda 2063. Peaceful and secure Africa, specifically mechanisms for peaceful pre prevention and resolution of conflicts will be functional. And a culture of peace and tolerance shall be nurtured in Africa's children and youth through peace education. So it's like, oh, that, that kind of is pretty cool, right? That there's a connection here. There is something related to Claudette Coleman's story in my mind, right? But what is peace education? Everyone I spoke to was unable to give me an answer. But in 2015, it turns out that the African Union came up with 11 strategic development goals that was going to help them reach these seven aspirations. None of those 11 strategic development goals had anything to do with peace education, <clears throat> even though it's specifically called out for in one of the aspirations. So I asked the ambassador for peace and security of the African Union, Adon uh, Adonia Ayabari, why? What's up with that? I like, hey, man, you know, that kind of seems like a mismatch. You, know, some, you missed something, or was it on purpose? Like, well, Pete, the problem is that we, it was hard enough getting this to be agreed 
because there's some dysfunction, as you'd imagine, in 54 nations, right? But uh, mostly it's because no one could agree on what peace education is. So I took that back to the Sheikh. I said, hey, Sheikh, I'm kind of getting this far. You know, nobody can really define what peace education is. So how can we affect strategic development goals to accelerate a timeline for peace education? And I liked the fact that the African Union had five regions in the, in the, in the um, continent and that there was a way of managing towards the aspirations. So you, you, can, you can't manage what you can't measure, but if, you, if you're measuring it, there's at least a structure that holds promise to maybe getting this stuff accelerated. Wasn't gonna work, okay? But I didn't know that yet. I say to the shape, this is how far I'm getting. With, uh, with like barely a blink, he looks at me and goes, Peter, you must talk to Mamadou. He's in Senegal. He's a Facebook friend of mine. Look him up. Send him a message. <laughs> so, sure enough, I send Mamadou a message. Hey, I'm interested in kind of pursuing a thought of adding a strategic development goal to the uh, Agenda 2063 things to maybe push towards uh, uh, peace education in the absence of a curriculum. And I, wanted to and, I, and I think it makes sense to then use that as a driver to develop the curriculum. What do you think? He sends me back five pages in French. Guy doesn't speak English, doesn't write English, right? Google Translate, beautiful stuff, like very on it, right? So it turns out he is a, a professor at one of the leading West African universities where they train teachers and has chaired Pan-African curriculum development efforts. So in our discussions, I'm like, hey, you know, you've done this before. How would you do this? Oh, well, you know, you do it like this. You have your first meeting here, you do this. You have your second meeting five months later up in Morocco, you do this, and then you have your last meeting maybe five, six, seven months later in somewhere like Addis, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, the, president, the headquarters of the African Union. All makes sense. Hey, and, and I'm thinking this parallel thing in the size going, you know, the African Union should be honoring Claudette Colvin anyway, and maybe we time it all together where all this happens because this is kind of spawned by her story in the first place, right? So I say, hey, you know, uh, Mamadou, if uh, you, you did this, do you have financial models on what it would cost to develop a curriculum? It's like, yeah, you know, uh, just, you know, for each country it costs X dollars, you'd send two people from each country, a dozen people from UNESCO, you know, blah, 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 Youth for Human Rights, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm adding stuff in. But he gives me the model, I start populating it. So now I kind of have an idea what it would cost per diems, travel, everything for a curriculum development effort that would be Pan-African inclusive including UN representation, leading other organizations. And you could say that this independent thing could wrestle down this peace education definition and curriculum development. And it's gonna cost X dollars, right? I'm like, all right, that's kind of making sense to me, right? Then I start to get hit by naysayers. You'll never be able to drive that down. And they were right. So let's uh, see what's coming up here. We talked about the 10-year plan, 11 sustainable development goals, and no peace education. The next reasonable timeline for rolling out peace education in the African Union is going to be along the timeline of the United Nations Strategic Development Goals. Now, they have an education uh, goal, and, but this is on a timeline of about 2030. So I'm sitting here in 2017 saying, you know, there's, there's a huge opportunity to do this before 2030. If this, if this Mamadou-inspired plan of generating a curriculum has any teeth, which I think it does, this thing should be doable in a few years, thereby accelerating peace education by 10 years. Claudette Colvin's story tells us that that literally saves lives. Let's, let's look into it. That's not important. So, somebody comes uh, so, why not a strategic development goal? Okay, this bottom fit, every single tribe and cultural group could be represented in the curriculum development, but the feedback that started to come back was that you would never be able to successfully drive down peace education. So people, and, and one in particular, Jennifer Onomo from mm -hmm. Kenya came up to me and said, Peter, you must visit every single tribe in every single country and get their support if this is gonna be successful. That is the last thing I wanted to hear. 
because it was, it was kind of, I was feeling pretty good about having a financial model to say, hey, it's a few million dollars, whatever, for, for developing a curriculum, but how do you model like going to 54 nations and talking to every tribe? It's just like crazy, right? Jennifer pulls, she pulled me to the table. She says, she says sit down, Peter. <laughs> she, goes, she goes, this is how you do it. You get teams of three, a retired teacher because they're respected, a retired doctor because they're respected, a retired government worker because they're respected. And you have them visit every tribe. But they're not visiting trying to sell them on peace education. They're visiting and they are bringing with them a discussion on peace education. They're bringing food and they're think, bringing drinks so people will come. It will be set up through the women and children's coordinators in each tribe, and every single tribe in every single country have these two people, and they will be excited about bringing this into their tribe for discussion. You will likely be able to get their support for this that day. And what you don't know is a lot of countries in Africa, all you need is a couple thousand signatures to force a parliamentary vote. So there's a lot of power from starting at the bottom. It's like, hmm, sounds pretty reasonable. You'd have to deal with stuff like the fact that Namibia has 13 languages, so you'd need interpreters too. You'd need transportation for everybody. You could buy an $8,000 car, or you could pay for transportation. You could model that, right? You could uh, figure out if you need a, a, uh, a, a, a person to do administration. Model that in there. Hey, Nigeria has 104 tribes. You'll never be able to visit them all in six months. You need two teams of three. Model it. I modeled it. And now I have, how much does it cost to do the curriculum development? And how much would it cost if we wanted to send these teams of three to every single tribe in every single country over about a year and a half time frame? How much do you think we're talking? We're talking 2.2 billion people, the most conflict-ridden part of the world. We know that accelerating peace education will literally save lives. And it came out to $8.4 million, which is nothing. Right, on, in the scale of things. Say I'm off by two, say it's $20 million. Doesn't really even matter. But what does matter is now that there is a, now there is a credible something down on the table as a stand that says, this can be done. I've been told by people in the African, Queen Mother told me this actually, I was very, very happy to hear her say, she told me that that is the most credible plan for accelerating peace education that she has heard of yet. So there is now this thing that came out of nowhere. I mean, my introduction to the Peace Coalition was kind of random, right? This whole association that led to Peace Lights was random. The whole meeting all these people and talking about peace education, learning about agenda, doing all of these things, kind of piecing together, meeting Claudette Colvin along the way, and having the pieces just fall in place, have led to this kind of journey that I've been on that is all Claudette Colvin inspired. So when we talk about her importance, it's not only important her, her importance to the US history, but her relevance now propagates to the world. And at least one third of the population of the world who should be honoring her. Now, I mentioned the five regions in Africa, North, South, East, West, Central. The sixth region of the African Union is the diaspora, which has every one of the same rights as the five regions there, and represents all of the people of African descent, specifically inclusive of all the people who would have been in America in 1955, which was four million people at the time. So let's, uh, topics for peace education. I often get <coughs> asked, you know, so this group is gonna develop peace education. That's, that's really a, a huge task, you know, they'll never be able to do that. And what I say is, we don't know what peace education is, but we know what it's not. Peace education is not a hundred things. It's a dozen things. It's 20 things. It's some manageable amount of numbers of things that a professional working group could get their arms around. Things like, not, not specifically, but like, defining terms, inner peace, tolerance, customs, cultures, religions, conflict resolution, peace documents, reasons for conflict, threats to peace, consequences, media influence, right? We also know that these things, plus or minus whatever else, are all on a foundation of human rights. Mm -hmm. A working group, a professional working group, a professional and motivated self-interest working group from Africa can get their arms around something like this, especially if they're led by someone who has done it before and is passionate about it. 
This is not an insurmountable problem. So, the human rights piece on the bottom, the foundation of all of those topics, turns out that there's an organization called Youth for Human Rights, the largest NGO in the world having to do with human rights, who have already created a curriculum, translated it into 70 languages or something like that, and, and it's already in the hands of 100 million people in Africa, many more around the world. But, so that, that's kind of like a cut and paste sort of part of that curriculum development. So much so that when you do the visiting of all the tribes, you're actually in a position to visit them, not only talk about peace education, but give them a little session on human rights to the children and leave behinds of existing, very well, well thought of uh, curriculum. So human rights must be made of fact, not an idealistic dream. That was L. Ron Hubbard who said that. And Youth for Human Rights uh, is actually uh, a non-affiliated, but, uh, but you know, related sort of thing. So curriculum development, I'm not going to jump into this except that it is doable. And there is Mamadou Drame, the guy from Senegal, who has done it before. And I believe it is achievable in the next couple of years, which has a, again, a save people's lives sort of impact. Now, all of this relates back to Claudette Colby. Now, I, I usually end my talks by showing this quote from Martin Luther. Peace is not merely a distant goal that we seek, but a means by which we arrive at that goal. Mm -hmm. And what I tell people is that just like her actions turned out to literally save lives, any action that accelerates the timeline literally saves lives. If you're, if you're doing the right thing and that propagates through society and participates in, in accelerating appropriate things, it is literally saving lives. What we have now for the first time is connection of the dots broken down in a way that makes sense of Claudette Colvin's actions, the relevance of her unknown, largely unknown actions in the United States, and how it ties directly to the fact that she literally saved lives. And she should get a Presidential Medal of Freedom, she should get African Union recognition, and that that message and that lesson applies to the African Union the most of any continent in the United States, that there are ways of addressing some of those issues, and that uh, all this can be done in our lifetimes, literally saving lives, literally putting back the credit where it's due to Ms. Claudette, Ms. Claudette Colvin, who uh, is still alive, living 2,000 feet away from here, and largely unknown. So that's, uh, that needs to be addressed. And May God bless Claudia Colvin. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions? Thoughts? That was so far. Got it? Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks. There's no charge. Yeah, I don't know. Thanks. Yeah, it was, right?